Thank you, Skip. June the 6th, 1990, my wife and I, for some reason that we still wonder about, set out to cross the Atlantic Ocean in a 31-foot boat, which is not as wide as this room, it's that short. And as you may remember, we didn't make it. We were fished out of the Atlantic Ocean some 200 miles south of Nantucket Island uh, when a huge storm hit. And uh, when we got back, there was a lot of press about the Coast Guard fishing this congressman out of the ocean. And some of our friends down in uh, uh, Congress asked us to come down and tell the story. And so we did, and uh, when we got through, they said, well, Ed, say, that's an interesting story. You ought to write that up. And uh, I never got around to it because I, you know, I thought it was a failure. We didn't make it. I didn't, just never could bring myself to write about it until uh, much later. And then I did, uh, after I retired from the practice of law, I sat down one day and I, I wrote the story up. It was all, you know, two or three chapters, maybe. 40 pages, and uh, when I got through with it, I went into Atlanta and I said, now what in the hell were we doing out there in the first place? <laughs> Which then we had a long conversation, why do I do dumb stuff? Why not I join the Marine Corps? Why not I go in the FBI? Uh, why not I run for Congress in Arkansas as a Republican? There are no Republicans in Arkansas at that time. Why not I do dumb stuff? which led to a whole series of questions which everyone in this room uh, will ask yourself uh, as you go along. Uh, how did I come to be me? Uh, which is, uh, you know, the abiding question uh, for all of us. So after writing that sailing story up, I sat down and I began to write about my time in the Marine Corps, and wrote about my time in law school, and. I uh, wrote about my time in the FBI. I was in Newark, New Jersey when they burned that town down in 1967. 26 people were killed, and I had occasion to witness that uh, firsthand. And then I came home uh, and went with Governor Rockefeller and started, uh, bought into the idea that you need competition in politics, and so we wanted to develop a two-party system. And so I got involved uh, in that. And we were trying to throw out the old guard, the Falbus crowd, and uh, open up government to women and blacks. New day for Arkansas. And it was a good thing to do, but there were hazards and prejudices then, too. I remember getting hate mail under my windshield wiper when I would go to places in, in the state. And then I remember going to Conway County once for Governor Rockefeller, Tom Isley, Judge Tom Isley, and uh, Judge, uh, now the, the later Judge Arnold, Richard Arnold, had managed to get a lawsuit filed and got a judgment against uh, Marlon Hawkins in Conway County, who was sheriff at the time. And uh, Marlon had been skimming money off of traffic tickets, and they managed to get a judgment. Uh, in the end, it was reduced down to $10,000. Well, Tom Isley said, well, if there's a judgment against the sheriff, the office of sheriff is EO instante vacant, which means right now. So if the office is vacant, they need to appoint a new sheriff. So Governor Rockefeller appointed uh, a, a man to take the place of Marlon Hawkins. And uh, we had a hard time finding somebody to take the job because there was a lot of hostility then, uh, prejudice against Republicans, particularly on Governor Rockefeller. But we finally found a, a man who, tell you, he's 83 years old, and he said, what the hell, I'm 83. Uh, I'll, I'll go up there. So. Uh, Tom, Tom Isley uh, looked, looked at me and said, we need to send somebody up to Conway County with Mr. Childers, Mr. Ralph Childers. And uh, so they looked around the room and they looked at me and they said, there, there, Bethune, you were just in the FBI. You'd be the right man to go. So we went. There were 500 people on the square in Conway County and they had shotguns and rifles and pistols strapped to their hip. They were not going to let us uh, go in there and uh, depose uh, Sheriff Marlon Hawkins. Well, we went in uh, anyway, and Steve Barnes was a cub reporter for one of the television stations at the time, and he said, uh, Ed, I got a deadline at 5 o'clock. Why don't you and this Mr. Childers go down by the sheriff's office like you're going to go in, and I'll get some film of that. 
they weren't going to let us in the office because they said the sheriff was out of town. They were just stalling. So I said, what the heck? So we started down. Well, unbeknownst to me, the mayor of the town had sent the city police into the city hall, and there was a young policeman named Price, and he had been given orders that if we tried to get into the sheriff's office to, to stop us, even if he had to shoot us, this guy jumps out of the shadows and sticks a shotgun in my stomach and said, halt, I'm going to shoot you. And I looked into his eyes, and they were going the opposite direction. <laughs> And he was more scared than I was. And, uh, but uh, a state policeman walked up just at that moment and started lifting the shotgun up and said, now Price, now Price, calm down. And the guy calmed down a little bit and uh, the, the gun came right up through my nose like this and over. And that was that story. But prejudice uh, and hatred, you see, uh, it's all from the same cloth, whether it's political hatred or racial hatred or uh, hatred about sexual differences, whatever. It's all uh, from the same cloth, and it stems back to our differences. Our differences uh, are our strength, but all too often, unfortunately, uh, differences work like miracle grow for prejudice, and thus we have all kinds of, of problems. These were some of the experiences I had, but let me just tell you, I also wanted to write about my childhood. So I went back and wrote about my childhood, which was kind of interesting. My father was also a victim of prejudice because he had polio when he was nine months old, and back in the day before Americans Disability Act, there was a lot of prejudice against people who were crippled, as they say in that day, had a hard time getting job, getting work. But he found a job once during World War II uh, at the Japanese Relocation Center down in Roar, uh, Arkansas. There were two in Arkansas, Roar and uh, Jerome. And my father worked there, and he would take me with him uh, on uh, some weekends, and I would have the occasion to play with the little Japanese children, and we'd have the best time, I mean, just as much fun as you could ever have. And then I'd return to Little Rock and be treated to the propaganda from World War II, where the Japanese uh, were portrayed as, of course, our enemies as they were, but there was Tojo with the buck teeth and the big horn rim glasses. Some of you are old enough to remember that. It was a very complicated thing for a seven-year-old kid uh, to, on the one hand, play with Japanese and then go back to Little Rock and be treated to newsreels and propaganda about the Japanese sticking bayonets and little children, and and so. I've always been troubled deeply by this business of, of prejudice. Um, when I was very, very small, my mother would every summer take me and my sister to Pocahontas, which was her home place, and um, my grandmother ran a little cafe on the corner of the square, served beer and everything. The old, uh, man down the street named Uncle John Shively would come in for his sandwich and a mug of beer at noon, and my grandmother would put him up on the bar, and then she would get one of those little coffee uh, mugs, coffee creamer thingies, you know, they were about an inch tall in glass, and she would put beer in it and set it down for me next to Uncle John Shively. <laughs> and, and we'd sit there and drink that beer. and. Uh, then uh, uh, the thing that she always told me not to do was don't you go down to the river and for sure don't you ever go down there and play with those river rats. Oh, there was such hostility about the river rats. Well, that's the first place I went uh, every time I got a chance. And I'd get down there and I'd play with these kids and we'd have the best time. They lived on these old houseboats like this one that's on the front of the book. And no electricity, no plumbing. They scratched out a living by digging for mussels and selling the mussel shells to the button factory, which would, pr this is in the days before plastic and all the buttons were made out of the old mussel shells. And they, they fished for a living. They'd sell fish, trade fish for other things to the people in town. And every once in a while, if they were really lucky, they'd find a pearl. 
and many times the pearl was big enough that it would get them off the river. And, but, but for sure they were feeling prejudice and bias and hatred. They were the outcast in the town. If I could, I'd just like to, when I wrote my, my memoir, you always have to end these things, and so I ended it with the thing that, that was most important to me. <clears throat> and here's what I wrote uh, in the epilogue. I've been back to Pocahontas many times since graduating from high school in 1953, and I was there again in 2011 to see old friends. When I'm there, I always go down to the river for old times sake. The town has changed over the years, but the river is unchanged. She is, as she has always been, a source of prosperity as well as devastation. She brought the settlers and the steamboats and yielded the fish and mussels that supported the river rats and the button factory. She's provided irrigation for the farmers and water for the people in days of pleasure when she behaves. Her mystique draws me close. When I stand in my favorite spot on the bank of the river down from the town square, I always think of Tony, the river rat girl, who was my friend when I was a little boy. She was a good girl, smart and tender-hearted. I think of the times we sat on the side of her tar-papered houseboat, our bare feet dangling in the current, our heels rubbing up against the mossy scum on the side of the boat. More than 65 years have passed since Tony told me about the river rat who found a pearl worth $500. She said that got him and his off the river. It was her dream that she would one day find a big, well-shaped Black River pearl, a windfall that would change her life. I don't know what I don't know if Tony ever found her pearl because I never saw her after she and the other river rats moved on. But I remember that determined look in her eyes when she said, we're not about to give up or quit looking. I always wanted to write that. So I began to wonder what what happened to her? What was her life like? I had just finished the book, Gay Panic in the Ozarks, where I wrote about another kind of prejudice and discrimination. And so I set out to, to write this book, and I began to imagine, what will be in this book? How will I write this? What, what's the story here? What did happen to her? What happened to all the people who had to live like this, and some who live like this even today. What, what do they do? How do they work their way through? What a struggle it must be. So one thing I try to do when I write, because these are sensitive issues, of course, is that I make the decision early on that I will provoke, but I try not to proselytize. Let the reader come to their own opinion about things. I, I, I think that's always the stronger approach to take. So I decided th there's only one thing for certain in every book that I write. There will be at least one mule and, and there will be at least one U.S. Marine. Other than that, it's wide open. Kizzy is an endearing young girl beautiful, smart, and she lives with her illiterate Mima and Grandpa on the one-room ramshackle houseboat. Imagine yourself living on a one-room houseboat. She loves to sing the old folk song because her Mima knows hundreds of them. Mima can't read or write, but she knows all the old songs from the Appalachians. And she taught them to Kizzy. And they, the river rats, had their own code, their own way of the river. That was the way uh, they lived. Religion, in my story, was not a part of Kizzy's life. She and her family just did 
what they thought was right according to their notion of life, the way of the, of the river. And this music was a, a big, big part of Kizzy's life. Now remember that uh, because just a little later on, I'm gonna have just a little surprise for you at the end of my presentation, a little music. Um, but Kizzy needed a counterpart in the story. So I created Stefan, a little German boy her age. Stefan, however, was born in the Neander Valley, just east of Dusseldorf in the Rhineland. And uh, his mother, a beautiful blonde, uh, was a Catholic. His father, however, was Jewish. And of course, at that day and time, 1936 being the setting, they kept that a secret that the father was Jewish. And Stefan uh, looked like his mother, so who was blonde headed, and therefore he was perceived to be one of Hitler's Aryans. And so they, they managed to get, get through. But eventually, uh, the little boy and his mother, after his father unfortunately dies, they leave Germany and escape to America in the late 1930s. And by and by, wouldn't you know it, after passing through the Pennsylvania Dutch country and living there for a short while, they wind up in Big Pearl, Arkansas, which is where Kizzy and her family live on the houseboat. Stefan, of course, faced prejudice too. And, but little kids, just like I was when I was seven years old, little kids don't get it, this business of why being different uh, should make you hate someone. Then the little kids don't get that. I didn't get it. And I, I think little kids are just good that way. So this, there's a scene in the book when I'm telling about young Stefan where his mother is trying to, his mother and father is alive at that time, and they're trying to tell him why they're going to go to America to get away. And they want to be as, you know, diplomatic as they can. So they decide to take him to the Neanderthal, Neander Valley, which is where the ne Neanderthal man bones were found. And they go there, and uh, I'd just like to read what I wrote. And imagine yourself a young kid like me at the Roar Relocation Center and when this is taking place. Stefan's father says, but right now, I'd like to tell you a story about the bones that were found in this place many years ago. Excuse me a minute. I gotta put on these. <laughs> these are for you. And these are for this. <laughs> But I want to tell you about the bones that were found in this place many years ago. Stefan's eyes widened. Is it a ghost story, Father? Anne Maurice, his mother, smiled and ruffled his hair. No, but it's an important story. She took a deep breath and said, Tell us the story, Victor. Victor pointed to the river and swept his arm to the east across the reach of the valley. This is where the workers found the bones of a man that was not like other men. They called him the Neanderthal man, and people began to talk about the ways he was different. Did he have horns or a tail? Victor chuckled, no son. He looked a lot like us, but he was smaller, and some say he was not very smart. Was he mean? Stefan asked the questions of a child, but he was interested, and Victor used the moment to teach. We don't know, but people have always fought with one another. Why? Sometimes people hate each other. Why? Mostly because they're different, but sometimes people hate people who aren't all that different. Stefan blinked, pondering his father's answer, and then he said, childlike, why? That's a hard question to answer, Stefan, but there are powerful people right here in Germany who don't like me because I'm a Jew. The boy looked as if he was going to ask why again. 
But the football players nearby gave a loud cheer. Stefan turned to see what happened, and when he saw the players with their arms reaching to the sky, he said, goal, they made a goal. Anne-Marie gave a little cheer and clapped along with Stefan. Then she cut her eyes to Victor. He gave her a quizzical look, but before either of them could speak, the boy said, do they hate you, mother? She pointed to herself. Well, they say I'm okay because I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile, but Hitler calls me an Aryan. The boy frowned and looked to his father. Were the bones Aryan or Jew? Victor laughed. Well, nobody knows who they were or what they believe, but if someone says they were Jews, the Nazis will not like the Neanderthal man. Why, Father? Anne-Marie answered, we just don't know why, Stefan, but we've decided we don't want to stay here anymore. She paused and gave the boy a playful push, and then she said, we're going to move to America. So, little Stefan gets to Big Pearl, Arkansas, by and by, and befriends Kizzy. And uh, the story, as those of you who have read the book know, is um, detailed and rather intricate and somewhat long. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the characters and the friction that was occurring uh, at that time and place. Um, and I created uh, villains. Of course, you need villains uh, in every book. And I created uh, one villain based on uh, well-documented facts from that era. Um, Sully Biggers is the character. He's a rich man thanks to inherited wealth and he owns everything in town and he controls everything in town. He controls the sheriff, the prosecuting attorney, all the county officials. And he's just, he's just an absolute control freak. And Sully, I mean, uh, Sully has bought in to an idea that had currency uh, back in the early 1900s, uh, an idea called eugenics. Uh, there was this cockamamie idea that we could have fitter families through better breeding. And some 20-something states in the Union passed laws allowing for the compulsory sterilization of mental defectives. And, by the way, a case of that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and one jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, noted for his brilliance and standing and stature in the legal profession, wrote the opinion supporting the North Carolina law, and he said three generations of imbeciles are enough. Fortunately, that case was overruled in the past, but I decided to make my villain in this book, a man who had bought into that, and Sully Biggers, this rich man who owned the town, had set up a eugenics center, a place where he would uh, do the business of trying to get the riffraff in town to come forward and either be uh, sterilized women, tubal ligation, whatever, abortion, whatever, get rid of those people. He hated anyone uh, that was different. I must add a footnote, too. It wasn't just Oliver Wendell Holmes. Some of the wealthiest people in the United States uh, supported the eugenics movement. The Fords, the Harrimans, the Rockefellers, on and on. This was a bad time uh, in America, and it is a blight uh, on our history. Bully, of course, as is often the case with fiction, uh, took his eugenics idea uh, to the extreme, much like Hitler did, and he wanted to rid the community of Big Pearl of all the blacks, the white trash, uh, the river rats, the mentally deficient, the Jews, the homosexuals, any and all that he deemed uh, to be different. There's another villain in the book, too, Cormac Manat. He is a wandering man who comes into the story when a great flood hits in 1937 and puts the river rats at peril. Imagine being on a boat in fast current when uh, the floods hit. 
water's awfully high all around the state today. Cormac, and this is the saddest part of the book, winds up taking, uh, being the only one left on the boat with Gizzy, and he becomes what she calls my make-do stepfather. She's 13 years old, and Cormac grooms her and takes advantage of her when she is 13 years old, and that goes on for several years. Kizzy, who was raised by people who live by the code of the river, is essentially amoral, and she's searching to try to understand what's right and what's wrong. And so as she goes through uh, the struggle, she passes through the various stages of guilt and shame, which are two different concepts, by the way. She works her way through these awfully, awfully difficult times. And fortunately for her, she meets a young woman in town named Olivia, who works at the library. Olivia is a student of Jane Austen. She's read everything that Jane Austen ever wrote, and she loves her. And so she befriends Kizzy and begins to, get, uh, to give her the books that Jane Austen wrote, and Kizzy begins to read. And uh, it, it, is, it is a time when this young girl uh, began, her eyes began to open and she begins to see. And of course, as she learns more about what's right and wrong, uh, the guilt and shame resulting from her uh, uh, abuse by Cormac Manat uh, begins to, to, to really eat, uh, eat at her. But Olivia, this beautiful young woman whose husband's away in the, in the war, uh, gave uh, a Kizzy, where's that other pair of glasses? <laughs> you ain't got the damn things on? Here they are. <laughs> Somebody said, what can an 80 year old guy, 80 year old guy write about a, a, a girl that's going from age at, uh, eight to 16 and going through puberty? What, what, how can you write about that? I'll tell you about that too later. <laughs> so Olivia, Olivia hands uh, this book by Jane Austen to Kizzy, and she says to her, this book by Jane Austen really touched me. She handed the book to Kizzy. It's beautifully written. You'll see. Thanks. Kizzy took the book and read the title, Pride and Prejudice. She was about to ask what the book was about, but Olivia interrupted. It's a classic, Kizzy. Look inside and read the opening sentence. Kizzy turned to the first page and read aloud. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Olivia swooned, but she collected herself. Let me know how you like it. As she walked away from the library, Kizzy kept looking at the book's title and thinking about the sentence that she had read. I know Olivia loves it, that's easy to see, but I ain't sure I'm gonna like it. First of all, there ain't no single man on the river that's in possession of anything, much less a fortune. And I don't know any married folks. Mima and Grandpa and Ma weren't married. And Shirley's got five kids by five different guys. But Olivia wants me to read it, so I'll give it a shot. So she does read it, and she gets hooked on Jane Austen and learns that there's an entirely uh, different way of life out there. And then, of course, Stefan is a, a big help to her as she begins to struggle and find herself. And then there's a man in the book a boy, actually, who grows up with Kizzy. He's also a river rat, lives just down the river from her. His name's Bertie. He winds up as a Marine. <laughs> but I can't tell you too much more about Bertie, except that he knew all the bird calls. He couldn't read or write, but he knew every bird that was on the river, knew their calls, could whistle them. And uh, he and Kizzy were just bonded good friends. And so uh, I got all the characters now on stage, and you can see there are a lot of issues that uh, are, are 
touching us today that are really touched uh, in this book. Immigration, the German boy coming to this country. There was a lot of hostility to Germans at that time. Uh, and uh, Italians and Germans were being interned just like the Japanese were being turned. The FBI was rounding them up because World War II, we were fighting the Germans and the Italians as well as the Japanese. And so there's that issue in the book that'll make you think, how did they handle that in those days? Uh, and so the, the sex abuse issue, of course, is uh, so critically important to us today. It's been around a long time, uh, and we, we, we must do better at handling that, and we must all be such a more involved in helping uh, get a grasp on that and working our way through, the, through that issue. Poverty, of course, uh, is another of the issues in the book. And how do we deal with that? A uh, few safety nets back in this time, CCC program, uh, the program that Johnny Cash and his family took advantage of and uh, set up 40 acres and a mule over in eastern Arkansas. But there wasn't much beyond that. And yet these people made it. And Kizzy made it. And the tenacity shown by people like Kizzy and by Johnny Cash and others who work their way up and then make the greatest contributions uh, to our way of life. Kizzy, as I said, loves music. And she wrote a song, used all the skills she developed from her Mima, and loved singing. And Stefan, by the way, his father was a classical violinist and he taught Stefan how to play the violin. When he got to America, Kizzy said, there ain't no violins around here, Stefan. They're fiddles. But he played for her and they made music. And so she wrote a song. And um, now I'm getting to where I can write a sentence or two and even make a story out of it. But when it got around to trying to write a song, I couldn't do it. I mean, I wrote a couple of verses about, you know, finding your pearl and living on the river free and you can be you and I can be me, but I couldn't, I'm, I'm not a songwriter. I can't even sing. So fortunately, when I finished my manuscript, the, one of the best things I did, of course I had Lana read after every chapter to say right track or wrong track when we're talking about this little girl now, you know, uh, and she would give me the clearance. But the, the best thing I did beyond that was I asked Karen Martin, who's the editor of the perspective section of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, to copy edit my book, and she did, and what a, what a wonderful, stand up just a minute, Karen. And what a great decision that was. Um, because it's painful when somebody tells you you've screwed up a sentence, you know? <laughs> or that it shouldn't even be in the book. And uh, Karen has such a nice way about her and she's, she's so good at what she does. Anyway, we got through and got the manuscript done, and then Karen, of course, is married to Philip Martin, and who you all read about from time to time in, in the papers. Uh, Philip's a dear friend uh, of mine, and we have uh, so much in common, not politics. Uh, I've got him down as undecided in this election. <laughs> but uh, Karen, Karen said, Philip, would you take a crack at writing this? Philip's been writing songs since he was a teenager. And uh, he just uh, put out a book called The President Next Door, which is a collection of the songs and poems uh, that he has written. It's published by Ed Alia Press. Uh, George is here, Jensen and uh, George. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. So I asked Philip, and Philip actually took my ramblings 
about verse, a verse, and made a song out of it. And if you'll listen carefully to the song, you'll understand why I call this a pearl for Kizzy, and you'll understand how Kizzy began to grow and to develop. Phil? I share an editor with Ed. I also may share the fact that I'm not a performer, but I have been writing songs a long time, and most of those would be uh, probably folk or uh, punk rock sort of songs. So imagine this in a higher key, accompanied on piano, uh, by a, a little girl with a really, really pretty voice. I'm gonna... We didn't get a sound check, so... It's... Some folks live in the great big city and some folks stay in town. Me and my kind keep to the river carry on somehow I can tell it's Sunday morning church bells on the breeze I'm in worship little green tree frogs amid the cypress knees I love living on the river free where you be and I can be we can be different that's alright I made the weak and the strong and the black and the white. He made the rich and the poor. He made the less and the more. He made us all get along. He made us all get along. Some folks talk about the sweet Lord Jesus like he ain't no friend of mine. He say howdy when I say how we get along just fine. He's a poor boy like me. He's a poor boy like me. Some folks going up glory mountain where there ain't no fields to plow. Me and my kind keep to the river, carry on somehow, we'll carry on somehow. Now I live on the river free where you can be, drag me, me, bring me never, that's all right. God made the weak and the strong and the black and the white. Rich and the poor, less and more. You made us all get along. You made us all get along. I keep living on the river free, where there ain't no secrets of shame. Found my pearl on the river free, it's where I lay my claim. It's where I lay my claim. Some folks stay in the great big city, and some folks stay in town. Me and my kind keep to the river, carry on somehow.